Chapter 13, we're going to do 13.1. So here we go, here we go. It's on uh, vector functions and some calculus starting in 13.2. So that'll be exciting. So tomorrow, I guess. Let's see here. I have pay per view and that's my iPad getting it out of the way. So um, our notes on uh, 13. Point, uh, chapter 13. So this is um, vector functions 13.1 on page two of the notes. Okay. So vector value functions, we actually saw them in the last section, only we just saw lines. And, uh, but now they're giving us um, a vector value function that can make a curve. And, um, and they say that it's gonna look, it's just a, a, an extension of parametric equations that we looked at in chapter 12. And they say they, they use the vector r for them as a function of t, that's the i component, the j component, and the k component. You can also write it in i, j, k notation. So this is in vector notation. Notice the uh, vector uh, brackets as opposed to parentheses, which would mean an ordered pair, uh, ordered triplet, um, which would mean a point. T is the parameter and sometimes thought of as time, not always thought of as time, but a lot of times it's thought of as time. The domain is the set of all real numbers. This is something that's new. For the domain to be a set of all real numbers and the range to be a vector, that's a new idea. We did it in chapter 12 some, but that's kind of a new idea for us as we're kind of going along. Each value of t gives a specific vector and t is the independent variable. And so this function gives a bunch of vectors and the terminal point of each vector is a point on the curve. And, uh, and so this is where it starts making the connection between um, the vector and pointing. And there's a little demonstration right here uh, while well, demonstration's coming, but this is uh, t is negative one, and that's the terminal point of the vector, and that's a point on the curve. This is the vector for t is zero, and that is a point on the curve. So the terminal point of the vector is a point on the curve, and on it goes. And um, and so um, anyway, and uh, so that your vector is pointing at the curve in space, um, and it's not creating a surface; it's creating a curve. The fact that t is has a certain domain uh, gives the vector, um, so these are our uh, set of vectors, an orientation and a direction. So this is our curve, r at t, the vector r of t is our curve, and it gives it a direction and an orientation. And so uh, now um, they've given us this vector value function here, and um, they're just wanting us to come up with just a couple of points just to be an example. And so um, pick anything that's possible to choose. So for t. And so is would it be okay to pick, for example, my favorite point usually is t is zero. Would that be something that would be okay to choose if I chose t is zero? So if I chose t is zero, then the vector that's going to come from that is going to be the square root of zero because I'm putting in there t is zero. So square root of zero is zero. And then um, uh, one zero take away one is negative one. So one divided by negative one for the j component, which is negative one. And for the k component, um, the natural log of 16 minus zero squared, zero squared zero. So the natural log of 16. Now the natural log of 16 is not, uh, a number, not a nice number, so I'm going to write ln16 here and brackets back on there. So the natural log of 16, you can put it in on your calculator. Uh, natural log, natural log of 16. And so if I put that on there, you can almost see it a little bit better that I put it in. And when I hit equals, it's 2.77. It's not a nice value. And, um, and so I don't, I don't want to round. I'll just leave it natural log of 16. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And, um, and so this is the vector. And um, so this is a vector, right? But the terminal point 
is the uh, point on the curve. So the point on the curve in this case is 0, negative 1, natural log of 16. And then um, the next thing that they ask us to do is they ask us, I'm going to see if a, a, if a different pen is better. Um, they ask us, maybe even a pencil is okay, to find another value. Uh, would it be okay to pick t, t as 1? Would that be something that would be all right? What do you guys think? Well, it has to be something that you can plug in to each and every piece. So square root of 1 is certainly okay, but you notice that 1 take away 1 down there in the denominator? That's not okay. You can't divide by 0. You can even put it in the calculator if you wanted. 1, um, and then I can do divided by, right? That's fine to do. And then 1 minus 1 in the denominator. And the calculator is going to tell you um, math error is what the calculator is going to tell you. You can't divide it by 0. So it wouldn't be OK for me to pick t as 1. Uh, would it be OK for me to pick, um, say, t as 5? Just curious. And so, well, square root of 5 is not a nice value, but it's okay to, for me to pick it. And 5 take away 1 is 4, so that's 1 fourth. That's okay to pick. How about the natural log of 16 minus 5 squared? So let's just try that one. So if you're not knowing about it, so I'm getting in here, and I'm pushing my natural log, and I'm 16 minus 5 squared, 5 squared. Right. So I've just put that in there, natural log of 16 minus 5 squared, because I was saying t was 5. And you notice math error again. I don't know if you guys remember about natural log, but the natural log of an input, this is the input, 16 minus t squared, has to be greater than 0. And so it wouldn't be okay for me to pick t, t as 5. So any other value that I might pick, um, uh, I mean, you can see that I can't pick very big values for t, otherwise it starts to be negative inside my natural log. And so maybe, and I can't pick t as 1, so maybe t as 2 is what I choose. Now, it's okay that square root of 2 is the square root of 2. Life goes on. Um, if I wanted to pick 4, um, I don't think 4 is going to be okay either. Do you guys agree? I mean, it kind of is nice in my square root there, but if you pick uh, 4, then we're having the, getting this on the screen, sorry, I'll get used to it. Uh, natural log, I was better at it last time. I think that my camera is hanging at a little slightly different angle, and, um, and so that's okay, but um, it's just getting used to it. Math error, though. And, um, and so, yeah, four's not okay to pick either. So two I'm going to pick is what I'm going to pick. Uh, it wouldn't be okay to pick a negative two, do you guys agree? Because the square root of negative two wouldn't be good, so two's good. And so this is going to give, as a vector here, the square root of 2. And um, it's going to give um, uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. And uh, 2 squared is 4. 16 take away 4, I think is 12. Is that right? 16, 16 take away 4 is still 12. The natural log of 12 is not a particularly nice value, but it's OK. Uh, at least when I do it on my calculator, right? Natural log of 12. It's not going to be. It's not going to be an exact value, but it's. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's not going to get math error or anything like that. So the point that this stuff goes with is the square root of 2, 1, natural log of 12. And they've asked us about the domain, and we're going to have. Um, it has to be something that they have in common uh, for all of them. And so that's the thing that has to be in your domain. And so I'm just going to make a number line. And I'm going to, I wish I had more room because that's, that's my personality. You guys already know that. You guys, hopefully you forgive me if you don't. That's okay. Two, um, but uh, it's better to forgive people. Uh, but um, the square root of t, if you're just thinking about the function, the square root of t, do you guys agree that the under part of a, a radical has to be positive? So this would be t is greater than 0, right? And then for the 1 over t minus 1, uh, t cannot be 1, right? And then the natural log of 16, uh, 16 minus t squared has to be greater than 0. And I'm going to put this stuff on a number line just so that we can you can kind of see. And the values of t that we choose have to be good for all of them. 
Uh, and so, oh, you know, I, I put this, uh, and then I had a pattern, and I was like, why isn't this one following my pattern? Natural log of 16 minus t squared, then that would imply for the domain as 16 minus t squared has to be greater than zero, um, and it can't be equal to zero. And so we're going to start putting this stuff on our number line. So I'm going to put a number line right here, and then we'll put our domain in um, an interval notation. So I'm going to put right here in the center of my number line uh, zero, and the t's have to be uh, greater than or equal to zero, and this way. And that is for the first one, right? So I just drawn that on there. And then t can't be one, and so but everything would be okay. I'm going to draw that one in blue. So I'm going to put one right here on my number line. There's one. And this would be an open circle at one, and then everything to the left would be okay for the domain, and everything to the right. But remember, we're looking for things that they have in common. And so really things over here aren't going to be good, but I'm just, I'm putting, I'm drawing the domain for one over t minus one. And then in a different color pen, which I did have, uh, where did it go? Uh, that's crazy. I had them all. I had several colors. Are they in my pocket? Oh, there are there are pins in my pocket. Yep. So we'll draw the next one in in purple. Now you might not know what this one is and like how do I draw it? And so uh, you would look at the boundary. I don't know if you guys remember that. And the boundary happens at when at zero when t 16 minus t squared equals zero. And the values for t that make this true equal to zero are actually negative four and four. And, um, and so they should be open because they would not be, um, because it, this is equal to zero. So negative four should be open because this side would be exactly equal to zero. And at positive four, it should also be open. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to draw a negative four. And I hope you can tell the difference between the purple and the blue. You can't. Maybe I'll try red. What the heck? I have it. You never know. I have this green color too. Can you, can you tell the difference in the green color? And so I'm going to come up here and I'm going to make an open um, in the green. And then I'm going to come over here at four. So there's three, four, somewhere there. It doesn't really matter, right? And then I want to know, is it in between negative 4 and 4? Or is it, it basically when you have these quadratic inequalities, they're innies or they're outies? So is it in between or is it, uh, is it um, an outie? Is it before and after? And how you tell is you just pick a point. And it's called a test point. And I'm going to test uh, t is 0 because I know where that's at. It's in the center. And so when I do, I get 16 minus 0 squared is greater than 0. 16 is greater than 0. That's true. So that means that where 0 is, which was in the center, is where our solutions are. So it's an any. So it's in here. And then we're going to put all three of them uh, together is what we're going to do. And so, uh, and, and we can write it in interval notation. Now you can choose to graph it if you like, all three of those put together, uh, or you don't have to. Um, but can you see that, that we want where uh, all three of them are defined? And so that would not be before negative four. And um, it would, and in fact, it would not be f before zero because uh, this first one that we graphed, which was t is greater than, uh, or equal to zero starts here at zero. And at zero, it does include all three of them. They're all three defined at zero. So our domain does start at zero, and you go left to right like you read. And, um, and then it goes until one, and then at one, it's open here, but it's closed there. If one of them is open, then that's not part of the, the domain for the entire one. And so we're gonna, um, we're gonna leave out one, so we can pick any value when we were picking t between 0 and 1, not including 1. And we knew that we couldn't pick 1, right, because it makes the middle one undefined. And then anything 
uh, from beyond one, so union, above one, not including one, all the way to four, right? And then we have another open, but all three of them are defined between one and four, not including four. We have another open at four, and so we'll put a parenthesis for open at four. And then this one, um, the natural log one, ends, and so that there can be no more. So this right here is the domain of this function. These are the possible values that you could choose for t um, when we were choosing t, right? And we chose two values that were in that. And we saw value, we, we kind of tested values that would be outside of that, like five and, and whatnot, right? Okay, so we did a lovely job on that. And I wanted to show you this little video, just because this video doesn't talk about domain, but this video talks about how uh, the vector function points and how it kind of draws it out. And so it's a little animation there. So we're going to give a try to that. So that's page two done. And I am not very, you guys already know this, I'm not very tech savvy. And so I have my iPad here. And, um, and this is from your textbook. I think I can zoom in on it. That's the wrong way for zooming in. Um, but, um, and they're just talking about that they have this function and uh, they defined x by 6 minus t and y by 1.5 raised to the t minus 2 plus 2 times the sine of t minus 2. So y is fairly complicatedly defined. And z equals 2 plus 2 cosine t minus 2. That's not the important part of it. Uh, and the important part of it, so I'm going to move it up past the function because that's not really the important part, is just that at different values of t, um, that you get a different vector and as you as you click along and of course you can pick half values or whole values it's hard for me to click it on here on this iPad uh, I'm not very good at it and I have to admit that it um, it had a surface on it that was shining really bright uh, like a screen protector and I took it off and so now it's sticky so my fingers kind of sticking to it a little bit uh, but I can push the animate and it, it, for different values of T, it just kind of, I wish I could make it go a little bit slower, but you know, it, it, it plotted the terminal um, point on the vector. And so you can kind of see that it drew out that curve and this curve, you can kind of see that it, it kind of curves around um, the, um, the X axis a little bit and even maybe goes around the Y axis there. Um, it's again, it's something that's drawn in, in two dimensions, although they do a much better draw job at drawing it than I did. Um, I, I did put, um, on the notes, I did put the, there's that. And, um, and so you can use that and you can go and play around with it if you like. And so we did a lovely job on that. And so I'm going to turn that off and put that over there. And now we're on page three. So here we go, page three, that's page four. Oh, don't tell me I don't have page three. There's page five. Of course, I don't have page three, because that's how I'm rolling. I'm gonna go get it. wanted them single-sided and of course when I printed them they printed double-sided so then I asked the copy machine please print them single-sided and the copy machine said that's a waste of paper and so then I had a way that I could try to make them be double-sided but then they got all out of order and uh, here's page three and um, and so that's that's how it goes okay so this is some general sketching and I have it now zoomed in a lot, so I'm gonna back up just a tiny bit. And, um, and so the first thing that they tell us to do when you're sketching these things um, is to um, identify uh, the x-coordinate, 
the y coordinate and the um, and the z coordinate. And so in this case, x is equal to t, and y equals uh, t squared, and z equals t to the third. And then what you want to do is you want to put two of these, this is one technique anyway, uh, put two of these curves together so that it makes something that you know how to graph. So uh, for example, if I put these two together, then um, if I put those two together, uh, replacing t in for, um, with x, then this would become, do you guys agree, y equals x squared. And I know how to graph that. That's something I've graphed before. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to make a, a little sketch of that. And that's a parabola. And that is a, a, a parabola that, so I'm going to just, I, I'm just going to sketch it in here. So a parabola going here, right? And I'm going to come up here and I'm going to make another parabola here. And then I'm just going to kind of connect these together. Uh, that should be straight up and down to make it look three, three dimensional. And, um, and so this thing is called a cylinder is what it's called because it stays the same shape of a parabola um, along Z, right? And so I, I've done as, as good a job as I can do at drawing it. And they tell us to draw this dotted. And so I am gonna do my best just to kind of make it dotted. I always forget to draw it dotted because this whole thing is not the graph of that. And so this is just like a scaffold to hold it is all that it is. And so, um, and so I've drawn my best here and I've kind of made it dotted uh, the best I can um, there. And then what you want to do is you just want to pick a few points and, uh, and draw them and get them on. And so like, for example, if we chose T is equal to zero, then that would give the ordered pair, uh, triplet. If T is zero, then um, X is zero, and Y is zero, and Z is zero. And you shouldn't pick anything smaller than T is um, zero. That should be the smallest thing that you pick. I, I didn't actually notice that before when I would been doing this problem, but um, uh, so I'm going to put that point right there. There's zero, zero, zero. And you notice that that is a point that is on this, um, on this cylinder that I have because it's a parabola straight up and, and down, right? Around the Z axis, straight up and down. Um, where's my three by five card? Um, cause I had it, uh, to show you, you know, this is, this is what it looks like. And when I turn it on, that's what it looks like, but it's, it's a, a parabola and here it is right there, you know, and it's coming on the Z axis. So if I pick T as one, um, coincidentally, uh, that's going to be one, one, one. I'm about to pick one that's not all the same. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of sketch that down one over one and then up one. And so that's, and you can, if you're like, oh, I want to be really accurate with it, you know, you can get, you know, well, I didn't draw that accurate. So somewhere it's on here. And, um, and I kind of just, you know, down one, over one, up one, right? And then if I pick two for T, then we get uh, two, four, and eight, right? So the first one, because here is t, here is t squared. t cubed, that's the first one that's not all repeated the same thing. So this is down here two, over here four, up here eight, and, um, and so this kind of thing. And, and I haven't done a good job to show that it's staying on here, so you might not even believe me that it's staying on here, but what we basically have going is that it was this point down here and then it's a point just going, it's points just going on the outside of this, uh, on the outside of this, um, on the outside of this parabola, parabola that we have. Okay, so we did a lovely job on that, it's beautiful. And then the next one, we're gonna try it. So if we said that X is cosine of T, and we said that Y is sine of T, and we said that Z is three, 
and so we're going to give a try to drawing it. This one's a lot easier to draw because z is just 3. Um, and so we want to figure out something where we recognize what it is. And well, I know, and I, I bet you guys know too, that uh, cosine squared t plus sine squared t, I bet you guys remember these uh, from um, both pre-calc 1 or 2, whichever one it is, I'm not sure, and also from, um, from um, calculus 2, right, when you were doing the parametric equations in calculus 2. So I know that, right? And so that means that x squared plus y squared equals 1. And that's a circle. And so we have a circle, and it has a, um, this is a circle, and it has only uh, a height of 3. So it's not making a cylinder. Z can't be just anything. Z is 3. And so I'm going to draw that here. And we can find the direction on this one. Actually, we can find the direction on this one too. Do you guys agree? That was the direction on that one uh, that I didn't put on there, but that definitely is the direction. And the next one's even going to be higher up. And it and I I drew this in here, and I didn't do as nice a job as 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 my friends of keeping it on there. But I do want to keep saying, you know, that it's it's on here. All the points are on the outside, kind of going along on there. Okay. Um, there's, there's multiple parabolas in here. That's the reason that, you know, that, anyway, okay, stop, stop, stop. Everybody knows. Okay, up here at three, one, two, three, and then we have this circle, and I did kind of find it better, and I did find it looked better when I, um, when I measured it out a little bit, and so I will measure this one out. And um, which I didn't do on that one, but um, you know, but then it makes me crazy how long it takes to draw them. And so we're gonna go in the um, x direction one, and in the y direction, parallel to the y axis, one. And if you want to know the direction that it goes in, well, you certainly can um, pick some points and you can kind of, I mean, it only takes two points and you can know what direction that it's going in. So for example, I can pick uh, T equals um, zero. And so if I pick T equals zero, then I get a cosine of zero, which is one. And I get sine of zero, which is zero, three. And so this is t is 0, and it's at the point uh, down 1 over 0 up 3. So it must be that point right there. So that was, this is the point that goes with t is 0. And then if I pick t is, and because I've got uh, cosines and sines, I'm, I'm going to pick pi over 2. You can pick whatever you wanted. Uh, but the cosine of pi over 2 is 1. No, it's zero, sorry, just kidding. And the sine of pi over two is one, it's really late. And then uh, z is three. And, um, and so I'd have to whip out my calculator if I'm not careful. And so I've gone from zero to pi over two. So here was t is zero. And if I plot that, it's uh, zero down this direction, one over this direction, up three. So it's this point right here. And so this is t equals pi over two. And now I can put the arrow on there. And so it's just going to go around. And if you just keep going, it's going to just go around and around and around. Okay, so we did a lovely job on that one. This one, we'll kind of figure out. I've got the drawing over here. I cheated a little bit. Uh, but the same idea um, that, uh, that x equals cosine of t, uh, y equals sine of t, and z equals t, and um, and then recognizing that cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals one goes with x squared plus y squared equals one. Uh, but t is not just one particular value. 
So we would be drawing in our, um, this is um, a circle, right? And then that creates a cylinder along the Z axis. So we would be drawing our cylinder. And, um, and then when we go picking some points, which I'm gonna do here, and I just wanna show you, I couldn't make it, I, I tried to make it look three dimensional and I, I just, uh, and I got crazy like I did on that one. Okay, so um, T is, I knew I could figure out what it was doing, but to make it look that way, uh, so T is, remember they told us to choose between zero and pi over two. So when T is zero, then uh, we're getting uh, cosine of zero, which is um, uh, one, and sine of zero, which is zero. And when T is zero, we're getting zero. So we're getting the point one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And that's this point right here. So that's the start of where it starts at T is zero. And then um, we can pick another point, t is pi over two, and just kind of quickly getting it, we have we get zero, we get one, right? Because that's the same as we had before. Uh, and when we put in z, uh, t is pi over two into z, we get pi over two, which is around 1.57, um, 1 right? Is that right? Uh, 3.14 divided by two, right? And so um, I'll plot that. And so um, come down here, zero, so don't move, over one, and then um, up uh, 1.57. And so that's that second point right here. So this is at t equals pi over two. And then you can go again, t equals pi. Um, when you do the cosine of pi, you get negative one. When you do the sine of pi, you get zero, and pi, which is 3.14. So this is in the um, negative direction for x. So you see how we get back there, then over zero, and then up pi, and we're gonna hit a point somewhere back on the back of there. And, um, and so that they didn't label that point, and, and we're just going around the outside of that can in a, um, in a kind of like a spiraling up the, the can. And you could pick more points in between. And if you go and graph this on a grapher, you'll see, you know, all these points will be filled in and you're just going around that, spiraling around that cam. Okay, so we did a lovely job on that. And this, they call it a helix. And so that was page two. Now we're on page, that was page three, sorry. Now we're on page four. And so this is a little bit of calculus. I think I, I said at the beginning of the video that the calculus started in 13.2, but actually I was lying. Calculus starts right here in 13.1 with limits. And um, you probably remember limits for calc, from Calc 1. Uh, I hope you do. And you saw more limits in Calc 2 and you're gonna see more limits in Calc 3. And so this is the, how to find the limit of a vector. It's kind of a, a vector valued function. It's kind of nice. It says what you do is you find the limit of each piece is what you do. So find the, if you're trying to find the, the limit of, the, of that vector, then you just find the limit of each piece is all you have to do. So I have this vector valued function and this is gonna break down into me finding the limit as t goes to zero of e to the t minus one over t. And, um, and so whatever means I have for finding that limit, when I put in zero in the numerator, I get e to the zero, which is one. And then when I take away one, um, that's zero. And then I have over zero. So I have zero over zero. Any ideas on how I can find the limit? If you're thinking L'Hopital's rule, then that's probably something that would be good here. And I don't know if you remember L'Hopital's rule. I hope you do. I abbreviate it LH and uh, is what I abbreviate it. So I'm telling someone, I'm conveying to someone what I'm trying to do. And uh, I'm trying to find L'Hopital's rule. Now, to, to use L'Hopital's rule, you have to have zero over zero or infinity over infinity. And so plus or minus infinity over infinity. And so, um, so I have that. And then what you do is you take the derivative of the numerator independent of the denominator and then take the limit again. So the limit as t goes to zero and then the derivative of e to the t is e to the t and derivative of one is zero 
and then the derivative of t in the denominator independent is 1. And now you, you do it again. And so when I, when I replace in t is 0, I get e to the 0, which is equal to 1. And so we just found the first part. And then you would do the second. And so this is the limit as t goes to 0 of the square root of 1 minus t minus 1 over t. And if I plug in right now, if I plug in, I get the square root of 1, which is 1. If I plug in 0, minus 1, so that's 0 in the numerator. And of course, 0 in the denominator again. And so would it work out to use L'Hopital's rule again? And the answer is, if the denominator is too complicated, then I would multiply by the conjugate because I got that square root. And repeatedly taking the derivative on things that have square root in them is not too fun. But since the derivative, the denominator is just t, 1, <laughs> is t, and taking the derivative would give me 1, I will only have to do it one time. And so I think it's worth it to use L'Hopital's rule. Otherwise, I might be, think, I might be tempted to use something else um, that we learned in Calc 1. And so um, anyway, so when I take the derivative there, I get the limit as t goes to 0. And now the derivative of uh, the square root there is 1 over 2 times the square root, the same darn thing, chain rule, right? And times the derivative of the inside, which is negative 1. The derivative of negative 1 is 0, and the derivative of t is 1. I didn't realize how close those look together with one another until we just got here. I've done this problem before, I have to admit, and I did not notice that they had that same form of e to the t and the square root, uh, and then minus 1 and over t. Um, but anyway, okay, now when I plug in 0 in the denominator there, I have 1 for this denominator, but here in that square root, the square root of 1 is 1, so this is going to negative half. I'm going to put these together, but I'm, um, I'm, you know, I'm on wait for it, right? And so I know 1, the first piece, negative half, the second piece, and now I'm doing the third piece. And so I'm here on the limit as sine of t divided by t as t goes to 0. It really isn't appropriate, even though this is 0 over 0, to use L'Hopital's rule here. And um, the reason that it's not is because um, this quantity comes in finding the derivative of sine. And, uh, and so it's a circular argument. And, um, and so, but that's something that probably most people have forgotten here. But I won't be able to help myself because I know it's not appropriate to use L'Hopital's rule on this. So I won't be able to help myself. This is a theorem that was, that you've proved in your book. And, and they, they did not use L'Hopital's rule on it. Go look at it, go check it out. And it's not because they hadn't discussed L'Hopital's rule yet. It's because um, that uh, they were using this to prove that the derivative of sine was equal to cosine. So you can't use it in here. But this, um, so if you go look and um, it, it wasn't, we proved it in Calc 1. Use the squeeze theorem to prove it. And this is equal to 1 is what it's equal to. And I always called it theorem 7 because in the textbook that I um, first taught of, out of uh, calculus, so I always call it theorem seven, um, it was called theorem seven, but uh, we haven't taught out of that book for 20 years. And so I don't know what they called it in, in, in the Stewart book, but that's, that's a theorem that that's equal to one. And so hot diggity dog. Uh, and so now uh, we can put this limit together, right? So I just found the limit as t goes to 0 of this vector, and that was equal to a vector uh, 1, negative 1 half, and uh, 1. And I was just kind of too lazy to put that in here, right? And so I just kind of said, okay, that's, I'm just going to, well, you know, pretend like I filled that in. And so then there's my answer. So we did a lovely job on that. Then I just put a few here out of context just so that we could give um, a little bit of practice to them. And, um, and so, um, like this one, uh, L'Hopital's is not appropriate right now because we got zero here, and, um, 
the natural log of zero. I don't know if you remember what the natural log function looks like. So I'll draw it for you so that you can remember what it looks like. But as you get closer and closer to zero, uh, as your T value gets closer and closer to zero, you're getting closer and closer to negative infinity. So this is zero multiplied by negative infinity is what it is. And so the idea of what you do uh, when you have that is that, um, I hope that you're remembering from Calc 2, um, is that you take this T right here and you stick it in the denominator. And so if I wanna move it to the denominator, right now it has exponent of one. And if I wanna move it to the denominator, then I have to change it to exponent negative one. And so this would become the limit as t goes to zero of the natural log of t divided by t to the negative one. And of course you could write that as one over t if you wanted, your choice on that. And now what I have got is I've got negative infinity over something that's going to infinity. And if you've got it as, it doesn't have to be both negative infinity, one can be negative infinity, one can be positive infinity. But if you're going to infinity, um, if you're saying now, are you sure one over t is going to, as t goes to zero, is going to infinity? And it is, right? As this gets really, really small, one divided by something really, really small is getting really, really big. So you can re um, remind yourself of that uh, with your calculator. Uh, that was a theorem that we learned in calculus one. One divided by, and then if you pick something really, really, really close to zero and really small, it gets really huge. And so it's going to some kind of infinity. Okay, and if I pick something that's um, negative, then I'm going to negative infinity, but you don't have to worry about that. It's just that if you have infinity over infinity somehow. Okay, so now I'm on um, uh, using L'Hopital's rule, because it's okay to use L'Hopital's rule for something like that. So this is gonna be the limit as t goes to zero of one over t that's the derivative of the natural log. And then uh, this derivative of this is negative one t to the negative two. And then what I want to do is I want to simplify that. It's okay to simplify that. And so I could say, now this right here is a negative uh, one. Oh, I could move that upstairs too, couldn't I? If I wanted, I don't know. I was, I don't know, I'm too tired to move it upstairs. So that is negative one over t to the second. And so what you essentially have here is one over t um, divided by one, negative one over t to the second, which is the same as timesing it by uh, negative t squared over one, right? And so, and when I times that, I get, um, do you guys agree? I get negative t. So this is the limit as t goes to zero of uh, negative t and as t, that's going, getting closer and closer to zero. So that equals zero. And then this one here, I have zero over zero, and I could use, I could use L'Hopital's rule again, uh, but this one, I could just factor the top and factor the bottom. So I wanna show you that just because you, yeah, you could use L'Hopital's and that would be cool and there's nothing wrong with using L'Hopital's. But I just wanted to show you that there that factoring still is something that you could do. Um, this is how we did them in Calc 1, right? And then the t minus 2s cancel out after I factor them. And then as I get closer to 2, this is getting closer to 4. And so then my answer would be 4. And this one here, uh, when I plug in, I don't even get zero over zero, I get three over a nine minus two, which is three over seven, and so that's my answer. So I don't even have to get funky and use L'Hopital's. And in fact, if you use L'Hopital's rule on it, you'll get something that is not not, not right. And so um, anyway, so it's not, you, you, have, you can only use L'Hopital's when you have zero over zero or infinity over infinity, or otherwise you'll change the answer to something that's not correct. Then they talk, talk about, um, about continuity. That's something that we also learned in Calculus 1. Uh, and this is the continuity checklist. If the limit as t goes to a of our vector is equal to the vector evaluated at a, then it's continuous at a. 
And, um, and you probably remember from, um, from Calculus 1 that the following functions are continuous on their domain. And so finding their domain is the same as finding where they're continuous. Finding where they're continuous is the same as finding their domain. Um, all polynomials, all rational functions, all root, root functions have the same continuity as they have domain. All trig functions, all exponential functions, all logarithmic functions, all inverse trig functions, all hyperbolic functions. The ones that are not continuous necessarily on their domain uh, are piecewise defined functions and, um, and step functions. And, um, and we're not going to deal with those. And so when someone asks you about the domain, it's going to be the same as the interval of continuity on the things that we're looking at right now and vice versa. And so we're going to, we're going to give a try to some of those. This is the last of our notes on 13.1. And, um, and so they're saying um, they want us to justify our answer using the continuity checklist. And the continuity checklist kind of has uh, three parts to it. It's that um, the first part is that um, R evaluated at one exists. And, um, and so that's kind of, and, and that, and then I guess the second part is the limit as um, T goes to one of R, uh, this is defined, R at one is defined, of our R uh, little vector guy T um, exists, right? And so we call that the checklist in, in Calc 1 and that, that this is defined for all three pieces. And then the third part of the checklist is that they're equal to one another. And uh, a lot of times when something isn't continuous, uh, it fails more than one, one thing. In this case, we're going to one, and so um, and does it find the does it fail the defined part? And um, I hope that you're saying, yeah, it fails the defined part. I didn't notice that that was the same function that I had uh, when I asked you about the domain on the uh, first until just now. Uh, I think I probably got that problem out of the book. Um, and so um, it's not defined, right? Because right here, one minus one is zero. And so this is one divided by zero. And so is this, is R at one defined? And the answer is no, it's um, no, uh, not defined. Uh, defined? No, it's not defined. <laughs> so that means it's not continuous because all three parts uh, at T equals one. If I asked you for the interval of continuity, um, and I didn't realize this, that these were the same until just now, and I know that sounds really silly, um, particularly as uh, much as I've, uh, much time as I've spent with these silly notes. Uh, that was on page two, and so I'm whipping that up here. And if I asked you for, so this was the answer to this question that I asked. If I asked this question, to give the interval of continuity. So if I had asked that question instead of the question that I asked here, then it would be the same answer as the domain um, that we got here on that first question on page two. It would be, um, so if I'd asked you that, it would have been zero to one union uh, one to four. And so that would have been, so they asked us, is it continuous at T equals one? It's not continuous. Why is it not con continuous? Because the vector is not evaluated, is not defined at one. And so um, anyway, okay, so we did a lovely job on that. And then um, these, they're asking us to find a, uh, find a, find a vector vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the two surfaces. And so, um, so we're going to give a try to doing that. Whenever you have x squared plus y squared equals a number, in this case four, what you're going to want to take advantage of when you have that is you're going to want to take advantage of the fact that 
cosine squared t plus sine squared of t equals 1. And so, and then we wanted 4, so you multiply uh, it by 4. So you, whenever you have a constant here, then what you want to do is you want to use sine, um, cosine squared uh, plus sine squared t equals 1. Now I know I have 4, so if I multiply everything by 4, then it looks like this. And then I want to let this piece, I hope I put a 4 over there, I did. I want to let this piece be my x. You usually let x be your cosine. Um, that helps you match other people. And so, um, so I want to say that my x squared equals 4 times the cosine squared t. And I want to know what x is. So if you take the square root of that, x equals 2 cosine of t. So that's going to be what I'm going to use. And do you guys agree that without me writing anything that, uh, that y must be um, 2 sine of t? Now, when I've defined that, all it takes is, because i got sines and cosines, that, that is just go from 0 to, um, uh, to 2 pi uh, is what they tell you in your book. So we're going to just run this from um, t from 0 to 2 pi because we got these sines and cosines. So just one time around the circle. Now, I haven't told people what z is, but I'm going to do that as well. Now, I don't know if you guys notice when you look here, though, uh, z equals, if I take away x from both sides of the equation, I get 1 minus x. And um, remember that we let x be this. And so now, all of a sudden, we have z equals 1 minus 2 times the cosine of t. And now we've got what x is, what y is, and what z is in terms of t. And so um, uh, we can write that as a, um, as a vector. And so our vector is going to be looking like uh, 2 cosine of t, uh, 2 sine of t, and uh, 1 minus 2 cosine of t. And we just need to go from... Uh, 0 to 2 pi, just because we had our sine and cosine. Okay, we did a lovely job on that one. And then I have a typo in this one. I actually got this problem out of the book, and I'm ashamed to say that I made a typo, and I made it, photocopied it before realizing that I did. And so you're going to have to fix this one here on page 5 to be this. And so it really was supposed to be x squared plus y squared equals z and not that. And so um, now we've just fixed it. I actually realized it, but it was after I photocopied them, and I just thought that I can't re-photocopy the notes for that little of a mistake. So now I want to put these two things together, right? And, um, and, and so this one's just a little bit, um, a little bit different because it's equal z. And, um, and so instead of equaling a number, and, uh, and so you usually don't use the sine and the cosine trick when you're equaling z. And, but it's going to work out pretty nicely if I just put uh, in for z right here. And my kind of my goal is just, I mean, there's answers will vary. Um, and so my goal is just to try to define x, y, and z so that it makes sense with um, the equations that you have here and, and that you're using both of them. And you notice we use both of them here. And so um, it, it kind of helps on this one um, to put in what z is 1 plus y. So we get this. And then it's real helpful to um, square both sides of the equation. So if you square both sides of the equation, on this side you get this. And that side over there, you get 1 plus y squared. I don't know why I didn't get the squared on there. And, um, and then when, I, when the dust clears, under here I get x squared plus y squared equals, and then you can write it twice in FOIL if you want, or you can use the square formula or whatever you use. It doesn't matter to me, but... Um, Hopefully that you don't miss that it has an outer and an inner term. 
And so um, when I foil, I get one. And my, uh, my nephew would say, this is the baby way of doing it. And another Y here and Y squared. And I agree. But um, it's really sad when we mess up our algebra, when we, when we use sophisticated methods of, of, and mess up our algebra. Now that I'm talking about messing up my algebra, you know that I'm going to mess up my algebra, right? And so you notice on both sides of the equation, I got Y squared and Y squared. So all of a sudden, I have x squared equals um, 2y plus 1. And, um, and so that means if you wanted to, I could solve this for y. And so um, and it's not necessary to solve for y, but it's just it's, the idea is then I'll have this solve for z, and I'll have this solve for y. And then the trick is once you get them solved for two things in terms of the other things, then you let the thing that you don't have solved for be T is what you do. And then you're, and then boom, you have it. So you're, you're going to see, you're going to see that in action. So if I take away one from both sides, so this would be X squared, take away one equals two Y. And then if I divide two both sides, then I have solved for Y. So I have Y equals x squared minus 1 over 2 and then here's where I'm now going to be able to parameterize it um, is I let uh, t um, equal um, x the one that I have I have solved for y I have solved for z and so you let t equal the one that you don't have solved for so I'm going to let um, x equals t. Then coming back here and plugging in what I just said x was, x is t, so then this means that y is t squared minus 1 over 2. And z, coming up here, z equals 1 plus y, and y was this. Um, t squared minus 1 over 2. And I probably would get a common denominator there. I probably wouldn't be able to help it, but make it look a little bit nicer. So 1 is 2 over 2 plus t squared minus 1 over 2. And, um, and when you add those together, 2 plus t squared minus 1, um, you get t squared plus 1 over 2 equals z, right? And now I'm going to put this together, make sure, um, and here, there's my y, and here's my x. So now I'm going to put this all together, and so my vector function will be x is t, and yeah, answers will vary, right? So this is just one way of doing it. Very clever way of doing it, I think. I'm going to give myself full credit. And this was y, comma, and then this was z. Okay, so that is 13.1, and um, I'll see you in the next video.